For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson. And I predict that you're about to watch the latest readout video from our Wednesday wake-up email newsletter, which I also predict that you will subscribe to if you don't already and make a monthly pledge to support us. Of course, I could be wrong given the famous warning about making predictions, especially about the future, and Abraham Lincoln's famous warning about believing online attributions, because according to the internet, we owe that prediction maxim to physicist Niels Bohr, baseball legends Yogi Berra and Casey Stengel, and media mogul Samuel Goldwyn. But our concern here is with news reports about the future, such as the Daily Star predicting sizzling and scorching weather for Britain under the headline, quote, UK to roast in thousand mile heat wave hotter than Morocco this weekend, quote. You see, increasingly, climate alarmist journalists don't wait for something to happen in case, like that heat wave, it never does, and then they don't get to do their gotcha global warming climate breakdown story. In this case, it got worse before it got better, with another piece on Sunday, May 18th, saying, quote, weather forecasters pinpoint exactly when UK temperatures will soon break 30 degrees Celsius, end quote, which isn't even grammatical. And nor did the story say what the exact date was when it would soon happen. Mind you, it did show attractive young women in bikinis enjoying warmth, which seems to be cross-scripting when you're warning about a scorching, nasty heat wave, although the caption, quote, temperatures could rise into the mid-twenties next week, end quote, suggests that British women possess considerable fortitude when it comes to basking conditions, although the actual picture was a stock image, so probably not of Britain at all. A more accurate story would have been that Morocco was forecast to be cooler than Britain at a chilly 21 degrees Celsius. But... Even there, the main point is that news really should concern what did happen, not what someone implausibly predicted was going to. And indeed, as forecaster Joe Bastardi complained on Thursday, May 22nd, quote, so much for pinpointing the exact days of the heat wave, no day in London above 22 degrees Celsius, end quote. And speaking of being fed up, we do want to present some encouraging evidence that for all the follies of public policy and politics, there is a slow, powerful undercurrent of sanity including that it seems the German government has had it with destructive and narcissistic climate stunts. First, quote, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz sharply criticized climate activists as nutty for drastic protests such as blocking streets or gluing themselves to famous paintings in museums, end quote. Then, two days later, police swooped on 15 sites across the country and arrested a number of members of Letzte Generation for committing crimes and fundraising to commit more crimes. Even the local Green Party has had it with these clowns. And about time, too. As Bloomberg warned bluntly, quote, Europe's economic engine is breaking down. Germany is at risk of a long, slow decline with consequences for the whole of the EU, end quote. So perhaps the long, slow reckoning has also begun. Mind you, not everyone agrees. For instance, the mainstream media. The Washington Post gave the arrest story the headline, quote, Germany conducts raids against climate activists alleging criminality, end quote, in the spirit of Canadian humorist Stephen Leacock's dictum that, quote, newspaper men learn to call a murderer an alleged murderer and the King of England the alleged King of England in order to avoid libel suits, end quote. But the Post story's text gave it away. Quote, German police launched a series of raids early on Wednesday across the country against a group of climate activists known for attacking art and gluing themselves to roads to raise awareness, end quote. Known for, not suspected of. And both activities are also known to be illegal. As we complained at the time of the stunts, such groups don't try to hide their lawbreaking. They put out press releases. They crowdfund. They solicit credit card donations for openly illegal acts. The BBC also did their best on Let's Degeneration with this sob story. Quote, German police have carried out raids in seven states in a probe into climate campaigners suspected of forming or backing a criminal group because of their controversial activities. Among those raided was last generation spokeswoman Carla Hinrichs, whose door was broken down by armed police while she was in bed, the group said, end quote. And heaven forbid that the police should catch a suspect at home. Imagine if bank robbers too were arrested while in bed or if police broke their doors down. Anarchy, tyranny, it's an outrage. I mean, look, we understand that civil disobedience acquired a powerful luster due to the campaign for civil rights in the United States, and rightly so. But throwing potatoes at a painting doesn't make you Martin Luther King Jr. And remember, he was fighting against powerfully entrenched bigotry in government, cultural institutions, and society generally, whereas these climate activists are pressuring politicians, media, and corporations that already agree with them. Or 
at least used to, until the consequences of their juvenile attitudes became painfully clear to the remaining adults in the room, or the art gallery. And now, a word from our sponsor, and that's you. Because at the Climate Discussion Nexus, we're dependent upon support from our viewers and our readers. Please go to our donate page, make a one-time pledge, or if you can, a monthly one. I'm not talking a lot of money, though. If you've got it, we'll take it. $2 a month, $3, $5. That's the sustaining funding that we need to produce these videos on our newsletter. And now, back to me. In the newsletter we also bring you from the None So Blind file, Canada's military history magazine Legion, with a story about how, quote, heavy ice forces new Russian icebreaker on long southerly voyage, end quote in which Yevpati I. Kolovrat went from its St. Petersburg shipyard to Petropavlovsk and Kamchatka in Siberia via mm, the Suez Canal. The story claims that, quote, latest Arctic challenges illustrate the difficulties in predicting climate change effects, end quote, whereas what it really should have said is, far from vanishing, the Arctic ice is so thick that a modern icebreaker can't break it. And from the Poor Babies file, AFP takes time off from fact-checking us to whimper, quote, Climate scientists flee Twitter as hostility surges. Scientists suffering insults and mass spam are abandoning Twitter for alternative social networks as hostile climate change denialism surges on the platform following Elon Musk's takeover, end quote. <coughs> who are those people again who can famously dish it out but can't take it? Oh, and Parker Gallant continues his dive into the opaque but lucrative world of climate alarmist charities in Canada. For instance, one in which somebody's getting over $350,000 a year, but you can't know who it is. In the newsletter, we also ask how the so-called energy transition is going, apart from the bit where it's freezing seniors to death. Reuters' sustainable switch hailed a race for renewables late last year, while the Atlantic's weekly planet gushed, quote, cobalt is at the forefront of the clean energy revolution, end quote. But we say the real question isn't how this thing is going, it's whether there's any such thing to go or not. Because in country after country, supposedly simple measures to transition are proving difficult, fossil fuels are continuing to be the mainstay, and yet power systems are struggling anyway. I mean, the Bank of England told Britons, yeah, you're poorer, get used to it, which some commentators suggested was not a helpful intervention. And in Australia, there's growing concern about blackouts, unhappy trade partners, and rising costs, with in-your-face headlines like, quote, soaring cost of power bills, a shocker for small business, end quote. Yes, blackouts. In an advanced 21st century economy run by advanced 21st century zealots. And here in Ottawa, a correspondent notes, quote, I have never before seen such attention to pay to power outages, end quote, in his communications from the power company. And then he asks, quote, is there any consideration for people on medical devices, such as home dialysis or CPAP machines, or even, with more work being done from home, business computers? Also, rather than just giving us coping mechanisms, why not try increasing generating ability, end quote? And on the latter point, the answer is, they did try, and what you're seeing is the result of their failure. So, to cheer you up, here's something else mildly encouraging. As Jay Budjachevsky famously said, and if it's not famous it should be, people are logical, they're just logical slowly. And thus one sees increasing acknowledgements, even from alarmists amid their breezy pronouncements about how easy the energy transition will be, that merely upgrading the grid to carry all the new electricity that we're not generating is looking a lot harder than it once did. For instance, in April, The Economist burbled, quote, the electric grid is about to be transformed, end quote, only immediately to add, quote, the technological and regulatory requirements will be immense, writes Hal Hodson, end quote. Canary Media hoped that, quote, this NASA tech might just spur a major grid battery breakthrough, end quote, but added, quote, interviews still got plenty to prove, end quote. And it conceded that, quote, EV trucks and buses need costly grid upgrades should utilities pay, end quote. Even Hydro Ottawa, which arguably has a dog in the fight, admitted last October that, quote, in order to accommodate this widespread electrification cleanly and at the level the country is promising, Canada's electricity sector must not only be completely net zero by 2035, it must also double or triple the amount of electricity capacity that we currently have by 2050, end quote. Oh, just that? 
Also last fall, the New York Times Climate Forward conceded that while solar is definitely surging triumphantly, we're in a heap of trouble for want of reliable energy, and quoted the neutral observer Doug Vine, who is Director of Energy Analysis at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, quote, a group focused on accelerating the global transition to net zero greenhouse gas emissions, end quote, that, quote, there's a lot of challenges. One of the things we need to see is the world coming back to normal again, end quote. That chaos and uncertainty actually are normal was apparently covered on one of the days that he missed history class, or one of the years. Then, on a less encouraging note, we observe that in a profile in semi-courage, the Canadian province of Saskatchewan's Premier Scott Moe says, yeah, he'd love to reach net zero pronto, but alas, there's no practical way for his province to meet Canada's federal clean electricity standards, which call for net zero electrical generation by 2035 and a phase out of conventional coal by 2030. The National Post newspaper reports that, quote, the Premier said he's concerned these changes could result in Saskatchewan being forced to close natural gas electric plants in the province by 2035, leaving many ratepayers in the dark and causing utility bills to spike, end quote. To which Federal Environment Minister Stephen Guilbeau, apparently forgetting his own history of law-breaking in pursuit of his climate beliefs, snarled back, quote, We have regulated the ban on coal through the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which is a criminal tool that the federal government has. Not complying with this regulation would be a violation of Canada's criminal code, end quote. Apparently leaving everybody astonished that people who are fanatically committed to getting rid of fossil fuels by any means are committed fanatically to getting rid of fossil fuels by any means. Who knew? And by the way, we'd be a lot more impressed if Premier Mo were willing to challenge the science instead of saying, as people typically do when they're in politics, this net zero policy is no good, send a better one, I can't think of a better one, so it must exist. And it must be easy, and I have no idea what it is. Oh, and speaking of political courage, in response to Gilbo's threat, Premier Mo said bluntly, quote, if someone's going to jail, come and get me, end quote. Which, again, would be bold indeed, were it not for the fact that he'll be out of office by then. In this week's newsletter, we also begin a detailed look at the new report from Clintel.org, which is a Netherlands-based group whose World Climate Declaration Against the Climate Emergency has garnered over 1,500 signatures from scientists and experts the world over. Entitled The Frozen Climate Views of the IPCC, the report examines several prominent claims of the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and points out places where they're overstated, implausible, or just plain wrong. For instance, in Chapter 1, Dr. Javier Vinos examines the claim of the IPCC that it's more likely than not that today's temperatures are higher globally than at any time in the last 125,000 years. Which sounds remarkable until you note, know, just for starters, that for the first 115,000 or so of those years, the world was in an Ice Age glaciation, so the comparison to that period is meaningless. It's only during the past 10 or 12,000 years that the world has been hospitably warm. And up until recently, it was generally believed the warmest part of the current interglacial was the Holocene Thermal Maximum, or HTM, about 6,000 years ago. Well, the IPCC wiped out the HTM with their new super-elongated hockey stick. But, as Venus shows, to get this result, they had to use a new proxy reconstruction backed by umpteen tendentious assumptions. And a look at the hard evidence left behind by glaciers and forests shows a very different picture in which the HTM is, yes, very real and warmer than today. In the newsletter, we also note that at his son Roger Pilkey Jr.'s substack, veteran climate scientist Roger Pilkey Sr. has published an intriguing post explaining pretty much everything you ever wanted to know about the warming of the world's oceans, including why the data and the measurement of the data matter so much. Using the Argo data, which is from a fleet of 4,000 really cool robot floats that cruise the oceans and dive down to measure temperature and then pop back up to beam it back via satellite, Pilkey Sr. shows that the amount of warming is actually a lot smaller than the alarmists have been calculating from satellite readings that are vulnerable to large margins of error. And finally, we dip into the CO2Science.org archive for a study of ocean acidification on algae that says, again, that alarmists are exaggerating as they will. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I predict that I'm John Robson, even online. Music